All right, well, it's been a couple weeks, but we're going to be jumping back into our um, series on the parables of Jesus, and we're going to be looking at the parable or the tale of two sons. Now, this isn't the parable of the prodigal son, where there are two sons mentioned there, but you will notice some similarities between the prodigal son parable as well as this one. But we're going to be in, um, if you can see right here, Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, if you'd like to turn there with me, or if you'd like to get your Bible apps open, Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32, and once again, this is a parable or a story that Jesus is going to use as a way to teach a lesson about the spiritual things of God or the kingdom of God. And so tonight we're going to look and see, well, what is Jesus telling us about the kingdom or what is he telling us about God? And I think the question that he is going to be challenging us with is this, is are you doing the will of God? That's the question that all of us need to reflect on in our hearts and think to ourselves, are we doing and living a life that reflects the will of God? And I think that's what Jesus is going to be asking and challenging us with this parable. So if we're all there, I'm going to read this for us. And it says, but what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots Enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So, just to give us a little bit of context here, right, of what's going on, if you notice, we're in Matthew chapter 21. So what just had happened in this lifespan story of Jesus' life is Jesus had just done his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So this is literally the beginning of his last week of his life. So this is, he's about to be crucified. He's about to be killed. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he had just gone to the temple where the Jews would go and worship. He went there and he literally cast everyone out. He cleared them. He chased them out with whips. You know, he was yelling at them, all this stuff. He was chasing them, clearing out, cleansing the temple. And all of these religious leaders that were, that would do the worship services, they would basically handle all of the different details of the worship and the, the temple. They see basically Jesus doing all this. And so what they do is they come to Jesus now, who's in Jerusalem for the last week of his life. And they basically say this, they say, on whose authority are you doing this stuff? You know, who gives you the right, basically, to come to the temple of the Jews, to clear out these things, to call us in our sin, basically? Who gives you this right? Whose authority are you under? So that's the context of what's going on. And Jesus then asks them a, another question with their question. So they ask, whose authority? And then Jesus basically says this, I will tell you this if you can answer this question. And he says, whose authority was John, his, his message, John the Baptist, John the Baptist's message, who was he working under? Whose authority? And then the chief priests and the elders, they hear this question and they start to discuss among themselves and they're saying, well, either we're going to say it was the authority of God or it was the authority of man. And so then they start to reason among themselves and they're like, well, if we say it was God, then there's an issue there because what that would mean then is we should have believed him. And they obviously did not. They rejected John the Baptist, right? But then they said, but if we say it's man, then all of these people, the, there's a huge crowd, a huge multitude that's been following Jesus, listening to him. They might kill us. They might literally stone us if we reject John the Baptist. So then what they end up doing is they say, we don't know. We don't know one way or the other. It might have been God. It might have been man. We, we, what do you say? And then Jesus basically says, 
if you will not answer, neither will I tell you on whose authority. Because basically, Jesus knows John and himself are both under the authority of God. They have come to proclaim the message of God in his kingdom. And if you were to reject John, you are then going to reject Jesus. And that's really the issue. And then that's where he goes right into this parable then, right after explaining that they were accepting or they were understanding and recognizing who John was and who Jesus is. Now he's saying, now this is kind of the reality of the sphere. And he then goes into explaining that it's like two sons. So he gives us two sons. There's a father and he has two sons. Now, the father, as in most parables, the father represents God. And then you have the first son and the second son. Okay, so the father, he comes to the first son and he basically says, son, I would like you to go into my vineyard and I want you to work for me. And then the first son, he hears this, and he immediately says, no, I'm not going, right? He disobeys his father. He says, I'm not going to this vineyard. I'm not going to work. But then over time, he starts to think about it more, and he starts to regret his decision. He says, you know, I really shouldn't have dishonored my father. I shouldn't have disobeyed him. I really need to go and work for him and show him my love and my respect. So then it says he regrets, and then he goes. He went. Then we have the second son. So the father, after speaking to this first son, he then goes to the second son, and he says, son, I want you to go into my vineyard, and I want you to work for me, and I want you to do these things. And then this son, he says, yes, father, I will go, right? So he says, I'm going to go. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to do all these things for you. And then it says, but this son never goes, right? So we see one son who initially says no, but then he goes, and then we have the second son who says yes, and then he never follows through. So why are these two sons so important to the context of the story? Well, Jesus is revealing the two different types of people in Israel, of the Jewish people that have been in this temple, that have been in this context as Jesus is coming, and he's basically saying this. He's saying, Those who were the first son, those who had rebelled against me and disobeyed me, but then came back, those people are the um, blatant sinners, the blatant sinners like the tax collectors or the prostitutes, the harlots, um, all of these publicans, all of these different groups. These are the blatant sinners that initially they just rebelled against God. They did their own prodigal living. They did sinful things. That's the first group. Then the second group are the hypocrites. So we have the first group, which is like the tax collectors, the harlots, that they had rejected God, but then whenever John the Baptist came on the scene and started to preach a gospel or a message of repentance, a baptism of repentance, then these people started to hear this, and then they start to follow and hear Jesus, and they're receiving this. They are starting to turn from their sins, and they're actually seeking after God. But then with the second group, these are the chief priests and the elders. So the ones that were in the temple, the ones that were questioning Jesus and saying, who gives you the right? You know, where do you get this authority? He's saying, you are like the second son who has claimed to want to do the will of your father, right? You're saying that we're the people of Israel. We're the teachers. We, we observe the law. We observe scripture. However, in their hearts and in their actual lives, they weren't actually going out and doing the work that God had called them to. So then what Jesus is then saying is he's saying there are these two sons. We have the tax collectors, the harlots, the blatant sinner group that have repented. And then we have this other group who are the religious leaders, the chief priests, and the elders who have allowed their hypocrisy and their pride to blind them so that they have not trusted and believed in Christ and John the Baptist. So with us then seeing who these two groups are and kind of what they represent, there's a few different takeaways that I'd like to offer for you. 
And then um, after that, I'm going to open it up. And if anyone has any just thoughts on anything through this parable, or if you have a question, that'll be the time to uh, mention that or uh, point that out at that point. But the first thing that I want to draw out is God in this text reveals that he requires more than talk. What he's saying is that talk is cheap. See, we can all claim to be holy. We can claim to be righteous. We can say that we love God, that we are honoring him with our lives, but ultimately our talk is meaningless. What really matters is what our heart is saying and what our actions are doing. So when we look to the chief priests and the elders, they were hearing this rebuke because they were giving all of this lip service about saying, we must be holy, we must fast publicly, we must pray loudly. They're doing all of this stuff. But inwardly, they didn't have a true heart for God and for his will. And we even know that they weren't even upholding the the weightier matters of the law, right? They would really emphasize certain parts that would make them look good, but when it came to other parts of God's word, they would neglect it, basically. So we see that we are called then to do something rather than just talk about it. We need to truly do something, and I think what he's calling us to do in this text is we are called to repent That is to turn away from all of our sins, right? If there are certain things in our lives, like the tax collectors, they were cheating a lot of the Jews, right? They were taking a lot of their money. They were just taking advantage of people that were really struggling with taxation and different finances, and they would just take advantage of their people. We obviously know prostitutes and harlots. They were obviously doing some very things that we wouldn't like to talk about in church, right? But basically, the people on the margins of society, right? That's basically these type of people, whoever you are, whatever sin you're doing, you are called to repent and then to believe the message of John the Baptist as well as then this connection to Jesus. Because it's interesting, as we said, this is the end of Jesus' life, right? The beginning of the last week of Jesus' life. So that means that these chief priests and elders, it's not like this is the first time that they are seeing Jesus on the scene, right? They literally have been hearing and seeing and talking about Jesus for three years. So that not only did they see John the Baptist, see what he did, saw these changed lives of the the tax collectors, the sinners, all these people, but then they see the connection to Jesus. They see all of the miracles, all of the teachings, all of this happening. And then basically when they come to him and say, who's authority? He basically points them all the way back and says, you haven't been listening the entire time. So that's basically what he's saying there. He's saying, you have been hearing the same message of repent and believe. And it's interesting, too, because Jesus and John, every single time they have started their mission, their ministry, if you notice, it always starts with, it says that they preached repentance. So that's very important. Every single time that they started their preaching, it was always a preaching of repentance. So we see then our hearts must be changed, but as we see then also a change of heart must result in a changed life. And that's what we see then in this parable because we see that they, it describes what the two sons do, right? It's a reflection of what their heart is, but the one son, the first son, it says that he regretted, right? In, inwardly, internally, he was having this regret. And so it led then to an action of him going, right? Back to work in the vineyard. However, with the second one, we then have They say yes, but then there was no inward regret. There was no change of heart. So therefore, their actions then went the opposite direction. So we then, I think, are called to say, are we doing the will of our Father in heaven? And I think then we must assess, well, what does the Bible say, right? To look, are we doing the will of God? We must say, well, what does Scripture say? And I think that's just one thing to note is, I can honestly say that all of us will know you are not doing the will of God if you are not in the Word of God. Okay? So if we want to ask this question, right, am I doing the will of God? I can answer it first off right now. If you are not in the Word of God, meaning if you are not reading Scripture regularly, if you are not taking in what it teaches, if you are not applying it, I can tell you right now the answer is no. You are not in the will of God if you are not in the Word of God. However, so we hear that, but then Jesus, in Matthew 6, 33, he says this. When it comes to how do we live our lives, how do we do the will of God, he says, we must first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what that means is this. 
how we can know if we are living in the will of God is we must think, is my whole mindset always looking towards the kingdom first? Am I thinking about how does this work when it comes to honoring God and honoring his kingdom that is in our hearts and also will come and consummate at some time in the future? How am I living a life? Does it reflect someone who is seeking first the kingdom of God? And then it ties in in that same verse, and his righteousness. So I think that you can then say, I know that I'm seeking the kingdom first if my life is living a righteous, chaste life that is consistent with the Sermon on the Mount, because that's where Matthew 6.33 is, right? He had just been giving a lot of information about how you live a moral life that honors God. He's saying that what you do is you seek this kingdom, seek it first, make that the primary thought in your mind, and then live this righteous life, and then you will know that you are living in the will of God. But once again, this requires us then to do more than talk, right? Because you can't just talk about the kingdom of God. You have to really let it set in your heart and let it flow out through your actions. So then this is my question then for this point is, are you seeking God's kingdom or are you building a tiny kingdom for yourself? The choices, the actions, the thoughts that you have on a day-to-day basis. Are you so concerned about your own life and making your own money and getting what you want? Or are you thinking to myself, I want God's kingdom? And I think that's a very important question that we need to ask. So are you seeking God's kingdom or are we building tiny kingdoms for ourselves? So the next thing that I want to draw out is God's grace is available to all of us. I think in this parable, Jesus is showing that God loves us and he is offering us grace and mercy. Even though we are sinners, right, he is saying God's grace is for you. And that's what reminds us of how Jesus ate, he drank with the tax collectors, he, with the harlots, those on the margins of society, right? Jesus was regularly fellowshipping and befriending these sinners, So we see this is an invitation for anyone, no matter how bad your sin has ever been, no matter what your past may look like, we are reminded that God's grace is greater than our sin. And I think that's what Romans 5.20 points out, right? It says where sin abounds, what grace abounds more, right? So no matter how bad you've maybe messed up, no matter some of the, maybe there's some deep, dark thoughts or secrets you have in your life and you're thinking, no one would ever really love me or forgive me if they knew what I had thought or how I had done. Jesus is basically saying here, don't buy into that lie. He's saying God's grace is for even the worst sinner. All you must do is receive that grace. You must accept it and receive it. So we recognize that we need the grace and then we accept it. Also, I think that though the emphasis we see here is the grace that is extended to the first son, right? Because the first son is the one who did the will of his father. I think that we see that there is clearly grace for both sons in this text. See, when we look to the different sons, we notice both of them were invited, right? Didn't the father ask both sons? He wanted both of them to participate, See, we see that, I believe, in the text. And then also when Jesus then makes the shift and applies it to them, he basically says that this one goes in front of you. He doesn't say that you can't get in or that you aren't going to get in. He just makes the point of this one who has done this is going to get into the kingdom. So then I think what he's doing is he's challenging those religious leaders at that point, just like he's challenging all of us, is basically say, don't let this message fall on deaf ears. When you hear and see and receive this grace, take advantage of it. Take hold of it. Recognize God's grace for your life and then move forward with it. So we see then, I think, there is grace. There's an invitation for every single person here. If you're here right now, there is grace that is offered to you. No matter where you've been, whether you're the hypocrite, whether you're the blatant sinner, right? There is grace that is offered to you. And this leads me to then the third and final point takeaway is You cannot obtain the kingdom of God without faith and repentance. See, these many religious leaders here, many of them missed the kingdom of God. Majority of Israel ended up rejecting Christ and rejecting John's message, and they ended up going to hell. 
That, that's the reality. It's either you have the kingdom of God or you have the kingdom of darkness. There's not a, a, you know, an option C here. So what this, I think, reminds us then is titles don't really matter. We can get so caught up with our social statuses and think, right, this person, they're really highly respected, they're really intelligent, or they, you know, they have a big house. God isn't concerned with that. God's kingdom is bigger than all of that, right? He doesn't care about these little tiny kingdoms. It's ultimately about where our heart is, and are we truly demonstrating our faith, and are, do we have a repentant heart? See, it doesn't matter that I have the title lead minister, or that we have elders here, or a deacon, or that doesn't matter. You can have lead ministers that are not going to the kingdom of heaven. You can have elders, deacons that are not going to the kingdom of heaven. You have to ensure that you have faith in Christ and you have repented and turned from your sin. Because as we looked at these religious leaders, they looked to their own righteousness. They thought they were the best in society, therefore they were good. But as we see here, that's not how it works. It's not your righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. But because of their pride, because they continued to look inward, they failed to see John and Jesus for who they were. They were blinded by their pride. So we see then the first son is the one who enters the kingdom. The second son has a decision to make. And I think then the question for us is this. Which son are you? Everyone here is one of these two sons. You're either the person who is blatantly living in sin and is in need and is uh, repented and turned to Christ, or you're that person who is living the hypocritical life. You maybe um, like the things of God. You may even call yourself a Christian. You might be coming to church, but you haven't truly placed your faith in Christ and turned from your sins. So the question is, which son are you? And I pray that all of us would be like the first son who whenever we recognize that we have fallen short, we recognize our need for the Savior, that we would do what Jesus calls us to do. Believe. Trust in Christ. Turn from our sin and follow him then in obedience that we seek the kingdom of God and then we know that we are obeying and doing the will of God. So with that being said, does anyone have some thoughts, comments, questions? I want to open it up now and just if you do have a thought, please make sure you have the microphone with the light green. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you uh, said if you're not in the Word of God, you're not in the will of God because uh, uh, the Scripture is clear, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the Word of God. But it's interesting in James, uh, the one twenty two says, be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That's in James. And then this one is even more, I think, potent. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Now, how can we know what these are unless we're in the Word? Absolutely. I mean, think about it. How, how are you going to do the Word unless you know what's in the Word? Yep. And uh, I, I, that I think that Jim's brought this up before, probably even on Wednesday night, that you, you see so many church-going people that are just so ignorant of the word. Mm -hmm. They don't study. They don't read. Uh, you know, many people don't, don't do a devotional. I mean, it's they get their Bibles out or the Bible app when they head to church on Sunday morning. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is, it, it's, it's the word that becomes alive in you. I mean, that, that's what, I mean, of course, it's Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But how can I, uh, you know, Paul says, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, how do we know to imitate Paul unless we know what Paul did? Right. It just it just struck me that it's it is. I mean, it's true. Absolutely. And the whole yeah, I would say that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the primary way that they express and show their grace is through His Word. That's how we, like you said, that's how we can know what is truth. That is how we can know what to do. That is how we can know the truth of the gospel is because we have the Word. Did you have something there, Mike? Yes, uh, verse 32, it says, For John came to you in the way of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And the way that John came was preaching repentance, mm -hmm. and you must be baptized. Mm -hmm. And I, do, I don't believe that these chief of priests and elders were teaching repentance. 
in their mind, as long yeah. as they were following the law of Moses, they were yep. good. Yep. As long as they had a gift to bring to the altar, a lamb, they could continue in their sin and be okay. Yep. And John turned that upside down and said, no, you must repent. And Jesus is, is reiterating that. You must repent. It's Absolutely. a change of heart. Absolutely. Did you have something? What I love about this parable is, <clears throat> first of all, uh, is the father. Mm -hmm. When the father comes to the first son and he says, I need somebody to work in the vineyard, and, and the son says, I'll go, or I won't go, mm -hmm. I won't go. You don't see an argument or condemnation. Yeah. I love that part about the father because how many of us as parents when we've told our kids to do something, it turns into a big argument. So we don't really get a repentant heart mm -hmm. or that child that thinks about it because they're too mad. Mm -hmm. This father didn't, he, he didn't condemn the son that said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So the son then had a time to think about that mm -hmm. and to come to his senses and go. And therefore, he also went probably with joy in his heart for doing a good work. Mm -hmm. And the only question really in this parable, I think, is when Jesus says, now which one of the father, which one did the father's yeah. will? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah. It's not whether he was a, a bad boy or a good boy. It's just he asked the question, yeah. which one of these boys did the father's will? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Are we doing the will of God? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Other thoughts or questions? No? Yeah, Mike? There's a element here where Jesus says, you know, that these, these people that you look at as sinners, that they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven before you. And that's, that's so true, not only of them, but today. Oftentimes you look at a person and you know their past and you think what an awful person that is and how can they possibly go into heaven. But Jesus is saying here again with that repentance that it's possible. That these people that you're looking down your nose at, you know, they're not high in society, but they're going to heaven. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You have the, the most prominent, well-spoken preacher in the world that doesn't have a repentant heart compared to the worst, dirtiest prostitute that had trusted in Christ. The prostitute is the one going to heaven, not the successful, successful preacher or pastor. And that's what Jesus is basically saying here. And I think this is what was so shocking to them whenever they hear that. Because once again, we think so outwardly sometimes. But ultimately, it's do you have that heart that seeks after Christ and turns from that sin? Yeah.